The fundamental problem we face is not the war on drugs. We are most, some of us are most interested in that aspect. But it's only part of a much broader war. The war on drugs and the harm which it does is simply a manifestation of a much broader problem. The substitution of political mechanisms for market mechanisms in a wide variety of areas. To illustrate, I want to go beyond the war on drugs. We all recognize that the war on drugs is destroying our inner cities. But if I were to ask any one of you, what is the next most important element in destroying the inner cities? I suspect a great many of you would agree with me that the next most important element is what is happening to our educational system. The terrible schools in our inner cities. Schools which, are, which do not teach, but which are essentially places to keep kids off the streets for a certain number of hours a day. Both failures have exactly the same sources. The war on drugs is a failure because it's a socialist enterprise. Our schooling is deteriorating because it's a socialist enterprise. Except possibly for the military, education is the largest socialist enterprise in the United States. There are, few, there are a few loopholes private schools to which parents can send their children if they can afford to pay for it, or, in the case of parochial schools, uh, if they have certain religious views. But in the main, 90% of all kids are in government schools. And that socialist institution is exactly the same as most other socialist institutions. There's a general characteristic of socialist institutions, whether it's a post office or schools or the war on drugs. It's inefficient. It's expensive. It's very, very profitable and good to a small group of people and does an enormous amount of harm to a lot of people. That was true of socialism in Russia. It was true of socialism in uh, Poland. It was true of socialism, and it's true of socialism in the United States. Governmental programs, you all know Adam Smith's famous invisible hand, in which people who intend to promote their own interest are led by an invisible hand to promote a public interest which was no part of their intention to promote. And I have for many years argued that there's an inversion of that is true, which is true. People who, in, are, who intend only to pursue the public interest are led by an invisible hand to promote private interests, which was no part of their intention to pursue. That's the case in the drug uh, case. Who, who, what, who, whose interests are served by the drugs? The U.S. government enforces a, uh, enforces a, a drug cartel. The major beneficiaries from the drug prohibition are the uh, drug lords who can maintain a cartel which they would be unable to maintain. In the education area, the major beneficiaries from the socialized educational program are high-income people living in affluent suburbs who are able to have good public schools and those public schools serve as a tax shelter for them. If they sent their children to private schools, the tuition they pay is not deductible on their taxes. But if they pay ta local taxes, that is deductible. And the great mass of people are harmed by the very low quality and declining quality of our schooling system. And the people who are harmed worst of all are the people who live in the inner cities. And these are by no means the only examples. Examine our major national concerns of which the crime and lawlessness that drug prohibition has spawned is certainly one, and the, educa and the poor educational performance another. And go on down the list. We have major problems in medical care. 
with total costs for medical care rising from 4% of the national income to 13% in 40 years. Why? Again, because the government has increasingly socialized medical care and there is just there is a very strong movement to move all the way to a complete socialization of medical care. In the course of that, the cost of a day spent in a hospital, cost per patient day, in 1989 was 26 times as high after adjustment for inflation as it was in 1946. And the major, in my opinion, the major reason was the growth of socialism in medical care. Look at housing. Why does the Bronx in New York look like a war zone that's just been bombed? Primarily because of rent control. Again, an attempt by the government to socialize the housing industry. We have had extensive and expensive public housing programs. In the course of that, those public housing programs, more dwelling units have been destroyed than have been built. I challenge you to find any major problem in the United States, any major problem, which you cannot trace back to the misuse of political mechanisms as opposed to market mechanisms. Why is it? The fascinating thing is, uh, to give you a rough estimate, I estimate that by any reasonable measure, the United States today is a little over 50% socialist. That is to say, something over 50% of the total resources in the country, of the total input, is directly or indirectly controlled by governmental institutions at all levels, federal, state, and local. Yet we in the United States have the highest standard of living of any country in the world. We're a very rich and prosperous country. It's an extraordinary tribute to the productivity of the market system that with less than 50% of the resources, it can produce the kind of standard of living and the kind of society we have. If I ask anybody in this room, if I said to you people, you know, you're working from January to close to June 30th, or maybe somewhere over June 30th, to pay for the expenses of government. What fraction of your well-being comes from those governmental programs? Is it anything like 50 percent? I doubt very much that I would find many who said it. that's true. So the question that my puzzle raises is why is it that private enterprises should be successful and government enterprises are not? One common answer is that the difference is in the incentive that somehow the incentive of profit is stronger than the incentive of public service. In one sense that's right, but in another it's wrong. The people who run our private enterprises and the people who run our governmental enterprises have exactly the same incentive. In both cases they want to promote their private interest. Any notion that our public, you know, we call them civil servants, when you sit opposite an IRS person, do you think he's a servant and you're the master? <laughs> the idea, you know, the people who, who go into our government, who operate our government, are just as the same kind of people as are in the private sector. They're just as smart in general. They just as, have just as much integrity. They have just as many altruistic and selfish interests. There's no difference in that way, but the one thing all of them are going to do is to put their private interest first. As Armin Alchin, an economist at UCLA, once put it, the one thing you can depend on everybody else to do is to put his interest above yours. That's a very, very insightful comment. You know, the Chinese who are on the mainland, are not different in people from the Chinese who are in Hong Kong. Yet the mainland is a, has been 
a morass of poverty, and Hong Kong has been an oasis of relative well-being. The people who occupied West Germany and East Germany before they were divided had the same background, the same culture, they were the same people, but the results were drastically different. So the problem is not in the kind of people who run our governmental institutions versus those who run our private institutions. The trouble, as a Marxist used to say, is in the system. And the system is what's at fault. The difference is that the private interest of people in the, pri in the private sphere is served in a different way. They do different things to serve their private interest. The private interest of people in the governmental sphere is served in a different way. You can illustrate that very simply by considering the bottom line they both face. Here's an idea of a project. It might be suggested to begin with by somebody in the private sphere or by somebody in the government sphere. It might be just as good in one as the other, just as promising. But you know, all good ideas are, uh, are conjectures, they're experiments. Most are going to fail. What happens? You or a private group gets together and starts an enterprise. Suppose it does badly. It starts to lose money. The only way you can keep it going is by taking, digging into your own pocket. You have to bear the costs. That enterprise will not last long. People will shut it down. They'll go on to something else. Now consider a government enterprise. A government enterprise is started, and it doesn't work very well. What happens? They could shut it down, but they have a very different alternative. With the best of intentions, they can believe that the only reason it hasn't done well is because it isn't big enough. And they can finance an extension, not out of their own pockets. Indeed, on the contrary, financing an extension will enable them to keep lucrative jobs. But they can finance their extension out of the pockets of the taxpayers, if only they can persuade the taxpayer, the, the legislators, and the people who control the purse, that their project is a good one. And they are able to do it. Because in turn, the people who vote on it aren't voting their own money. They're spending somebody else's money. And nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. So the end result is that when a private enterprise fails, it's closed down. When a government enterprise fails, it's expanded. <laughs> Isn't that exactly what's been happening in the area of drugs? Isn't that what's been happening in the area of schooling? I mentioned the terror, we are all aware of the deterioration in schooling. But are you aware that we are now spending per pupil, on the average, three times as much as we were 30 years ago, after adjustment for inflation? There's a general rule in government and bureaucratic enterprises. The more you put in, the less you get out. 